So, hi everybody. We are going to talk about Laureen Niedeker's poem, Foreclosure. I'll read it and then we'll just, it's a short poem, so we don't have to do it in order and we'll just see what we can make of it, okay? Here we go. Foreclosure. Tell him to take my bare walls down, my cement abutments, their parties thereof and claws of claws. Leave me the land, scratch out the land. May prose and pop property both die out and leave me peace. I'm gonna read it again. Foreclosure. Tell him to take my bare walls down, my cement abutments, their parties thereof and claws of claws. Leave me the land, scratch out the land. May prose and property both die out and leave me peace. Okay, Mandana, in the most general way, what's the location? Where are we? What's the situation? Um, she's probably in some sort of homestead or kind of, uh, I'm thinking, central part of the United States, and she's being foreclosed. And what is, um, Erica, what is foreclosure in the most basic sense in the United States or anywhere? She's losing her house. To whom? The bank. The bank, presumably. Uh, and, and, and this is the case, Laureen Niedeker owned a house that she'd inherited or bought maybe from her mother, a pretty modest house in rural Wisconsin. And this poem, I believe, was written in the 1930s. So this was a time of the Depression where the banks had to foreclose or chose to foreclose. So does anybody want to say a little more specifically what foreclosure entails? Allison? You lose your home and maybe everything that's in it too, right? I mean, you're, you're homeless. You become, you lose that space. Mm -hmm. it, it's also pretty brutal because they will come and take every bit of it, which is why yeah. that whole area of take my walls, take these cement abutments is so profound. They are literally dismantling a home. Um, that potentially was in her family. They're, yeah, they're parting it out, right? It's like there's not. So she's her attitude toward this scene is. She's pissed. She's pissed. She's angry. <laughs> um, Marianne, can you help us with the verbs here? Um, what kind of verbs are these? Tell them, leave me, scratch out. How do those verbs function? Um, they're very direct. I mean, I love the first just tell them. I mean, that's very colloquial. It kind of sets the tone for, for the poem. Yep. Um, and even just take my bare walls. Mm -hmm. You have a Is there a of, subject in that grammatical arrangement? We have an object. The house. It's usually the house. But the no, home. the subject would be I Probably or... I, yes. But is there a subject? It's an imperative. It's an imperative. That's where we were going. So this is an imperative. So she's using imperatives, right? Leave me the land, scratch out the land. Okay. So, um, Ramina, let's just look at the first line. Tell him to take my bare walls down. What, what's she saying? Translate into regular English. That's pretty regular English. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess she's talking about her Why house. Why are they bare? Oh, I guess, I mean, she, I guess her house is being foreclosed on. <clears throat> she doesn't have a lot of money, so maybe she's already sold a lot of things. So there's two possibilities. One she is that she's house. just, Laureen Niedeker lives in a fairly bare wall with bare walls. The other is she's prepped for the foreclosure. She's taken her things down. Okay. And why is she, why does she say, go ahead and take my wall down? That's an odd thing if she's pissed, as Allison puts it. I feel like she's kind of, um... Like in her desperation, she's just sort of like, well, to hell with it. Like, just take everything. You yeah, know? go ahead, she's make kind my of, day. She's take giving my it walls. up. She's I abandoning love the bare thing. walls because she's yeah. kind of saying, I already have nothing. I already have nothing. Take, go ahead and take, take them down. The yeah. yeah, Trace, were you going to add to that? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that there, it's sort of like, you, um, it's, it's changing the terms of what she has and doesn't have and reframing it. Exactly. And the second line, my cement abutments, and probably we don't need to say much about that because it continues what's been said, but it adds something, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. What does it add? Mandana, what does it add? Well, cement is something that, first of all, you can't imagine being able to take the cement abutments. So it's an impossibility. Mm -hmm. It's and also, just like the word as language, <laughs> yeah. the phrase cement abutments. What does it do, Erica, that language? 
It's got that sonic quality. And what it. kind of sonic quality does it have? Like it sounds the way that we make sense of it. Like it's abutment is almost onomatopoetic. Yeah. It's like yeah. you're going to move something called an abutment. <laughs> I don't yeah. think you can move an abutment. Right. You're not going to be able to move a cement abutment. Uh -huh. Go ahead, try to move my cement abutment. <laughs> I'm a poet. You can't move my cement abutment. So it's really like she's basically locking down the, the, the possessions, which turn out to be words, because that's all she has left, kind of going to the end, but whatever. So tell them tell to take my bare walls down, my cement abutments. And now, Pamela, they're parties thereof. Have you ever worked with lawyers? Can you move the mic toward her? Great, thank you. Do you want to say something about that? I think she's just trying to use legalese, because when you get foreclosed upon, you get served with a lot of papers and a lot of legal papers and so she's just saying the parties thereof and you know they can be very confusing all those legal papers yeah so what what is confusing about the mm. legal situation you're you're on it i'm just trying to get you to say it again their parties thereof what's confusing about that anybody well, i'll speak as a You'll speak as a what? A law librarian. Oh, you know the law. Yes, uh, okay. So I'll say that abutment starts to get into legal language. You know, it has that kind of formal norm, Norman French sound to it. And then there are parties thereof. Well, she's a party. Yeah. The bank's a party. Why do um, lawyers, especially jerky, jerky, sorry for anybody who's listening to this, but Jerky lawyers who are involved in foreclosures in the middle of Wisconsin in the Depression. Come on, can't you find a better job than that? But why do they use language like this? Why can't they just say, you owe us money, you can't pay monthly, we own the note, we collect on the note, we're coming to the house to get it from you. Why can't they say that? Well, this depersonalizes a, a pretty tragic situation. La legal language depersonalizes it and confuses people. Yeah. The parties are the first part and the parties are their parties thereof. She is clearly satirizing well, language. She's that, claiming their language as they're claiming her land, which is kind of fantastic. Wow. <laughs> Say it again, please, because she's, this is for the she's record. She's claiming their language just as they're claiming her land, and she's kind of beating them over the yes. head with it. She's definitely be with cement abutments. She, <laughs> she is saying, um, you could, we, as we said in the previous line, I've got language that you cannot move. You've got language that just dissipates into crap. I'm taking that language from my poem. What's left to possess? Right. It's really radical. He's basically doing what left-wingers in the 1930s did in this city, when basically there were foreclosures and family, whole neighborhoods would get there and they'd, they'd stand there with all the possessions on the steps and say, you can't, you're not gonna be able to foreclose. And the banks usually typically went away and then they bring the police back and the police didn't wanna do it and it, this was the way that way people organized. Well, she's not that organized. She doesn't have a lot of friends and neighbors. So she's using the only thing she has, the equivalent of those anti-foreclosure parties is, or gatherings, or organizations or movements is her words, her language. That's what she's got to do this resistance. And then there are parties thereof and clause of clause. Oh, Justin, so can you do anything with that? Um, I don't know how much. Uh, it's a, a bit so, of a pun. That's maybe all you need to do. Yeah, it's a bit punny. It's, it's almost, it would almost be the cornier twee. It, it, it's interesting how the, the Two phrases, my cement abutments kind of starts introducing this language um, that she's satirizing, the parties thereof. Um, and then by clause of clause, she started really just breaking it, it breaking down into just openly mocking it. Clause yeah, of it's clause. probably mocking something, but can you translate it? It's, uh, there, it is English. Yeah, so a, a clause, like a, a legal clause, I imagine this yep. you know, contract or eviction notice um, or foreclosure note that's been posted on our. And what's our clause, wall. the second clause? clause in, like, you know, like, you, like an animal would have. Yeah, what else is it, anybody? In the, in the, recent, in the recent bank crisis of 2008-2009, clause was a word used much in the news. Anybody? It's greedy. What's that? It's very greedy. It's a, it's a greedy image. It's a greedy image of? What? Well, clawbacks 
were the effort to take some of the bonuses back from the bankers who excessively took bonuses while everybody else foreclosed. Because it, it was a foreclosure crisis, ultimately, 2008, 2009. And they're using Marianne. words, the clause, to, to do the taking. Yes, so that, I love, clawbacks is like one of the great words to come out of that most recent crisis. I think without that most recent crisis, we'd have a harder time reading this poem, alas. Um, that's not why I'm glad we had the crisis, but and clause of clause. So basically, this is legal theft, legal robbery, and she's punning on that to, wait, to mock it, as was suggested earlier. Okay, then new stanza, leave me the land. So I yeah, this is this. complicated, Allison. So, well, I I wanted to just uh, emphasize what you had said about the clause of clause, which is that it's a legalized shakedown. I mean, it's really just an institutionalized ability to take from innocent people for the most part. Um, and I love how the clause of clause links with scratch out the land. Nice. I like that those two come together. Clause and scratch work perfectly. Yeah. So, but 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 you're not there yet. We're at leave me the land. So leaving the leave me the land, mm -hmm. scratch out the land, right? Just leave me. That's but it. When, when she says leave me the land, what she's saying, translate that into content. Leave me my. I don't care about the building. She's I saying, want the take grass. The house. Have yeah. you ever seen Laurie Nadeker's house yeah. in pictures? <laughs> it's not much. It's kind of concrete <laughs> blocks and, but the land. Yeah, that's the value. Is an, is a Native American land. Uh, I think it's Blackhawk, mm -hmm. and she's on Blackhawk Island, which is not quite an island, and she's basically saying, "Okay, you're going to take the house, take the house, but leave me the land. Why? Why? What's ne what would what would Blackhawk say about that? Native Americans don't believe in the ownership of land. Exactly. She's basically saying, you don't own the land, I don't own the land, you can't take the land, leave yeah, me the land. Right. And that's why she says then later, may it die out. Yes, we'll get to that. So leave me the land and then scratch out the land. Jane, do you want to, let's, yeah, Pamela and then Jane. I just thought she was being really sarcastic when she was talking about leave me the land, scratch out the land. The whole, it has a whole tone of sarcasm to well, it. What does scratch out colon the land mean? Uh, go back to just leave me from that previous statement. If you scratch out the land, she's just saying kind of like leave me alone. Scratch out the land is confusing unless. Oh, are you scratching it on an actual contract? Are you scratching mm -hmm. out the what land? What if you're scratching it out on the contract? Mm -hmm. Scratch out the land. Jane, you were going to yeah, say that? Right, so leave me the land, scratch out the land. So she's trying to get the contract revised and scratch uh, reflects back on clause very nicely. Chris, you were going to say something brilliant as you did well, before. Well, no, sir, if you Can scratch out mic? the land from the previous sentence, then you're lucky to just leave me. Yeah, that's cool. Do that again. Um, if you scratch out the land from the previous line, you're left with just leave me. Leave me, which is sort of where she's at. Chris, can we give this guy an honorary PhD or something? Or do you have one already? You probably have one already. Okay. Um, the colon is the only punctuation in the whole. So, but I, I don't, I don't know. Can you speak generally to the absence of punctuation in this poem? in a meaningful way, because you know modern poetry is all about how formal choices reflect content. So does the choice of no punctuation reflect her content? Tough question. She is saying, let's not have rules. Let's just speak, let's just be, let's just live on the land without. All. And in Dickinson, now granted you've only done the one Dickinson poem so far, but I just called you out. I didn't mean to that. Um, in, the Dickens, in Dickinson, her experimentation with punctuation leads to what? And you can get help from anybody here. Um, you have one lifeline. Sure. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. It, what, would, what would experimentation with punctuation do in terms of content? In terms of content? In terms of content, I'm not sure. In terms of like being read out loud, it, it informs a lot. It, it, it gives you a lot of 
structures on on how to say it. Whereas if you do have if you do have, whereas this I can I can say it however I like. Yes. So the lack of punctuation opens the meaning, and in Dickinson, the use of dashes, which is a resistant way of doing something that's ambiguous at these moments of pause. So colons subordinate, semicolons equate, but then the second isn't as important as the first. Periods cause you to stop and think about something else differently. Commas create lists. And Dickinson is sort of anti-subordination, and certainly uh, Whitman is, right? And so if you eliminate syntax, if you will, sorry, if you eliminate punctuation, you get an openness. And that is a defiance against the contracts and foreclosure documents, which have all the periods in the right way, and as it were, are dotting I's and crossing T's. And she's basically evacuating her open-ended poetry to leave her the land. Except on her one like strong command. <laughs> Except for that one moment, yeah. yeah. Um, we're going to look at the last two lines, and I'm going to invite Dan to prepare Dan to prepare uh, a comment, any comment at all on those last two lines. So let's start while we warm up for Dan. May prose and property both die out and leave me peace. Okay, the first thing we have to do with is deal, and I'm, I'm going to invite, um, I'm going to invite Rebecca to respond to this. Um, and also, um, I'm so sorry, Suzanne, and Suzanne as well, if you would like. Okay, tell us about prose and property. What do prose and property have to do with each other? Why would she put them together? It's so funny to have prose in there. Well, you they, can pass if you want. Well, no, there's alliteration there. And oh, then, good. And then, um, you know, law is prose. Yeah. A and law believes in you know, property. Okay, and what did Emily Dickinson say about prose? Does anybody want to? I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, etc. What's she saying about prose there, Dickinson? Anybody? It's limited. It's limited, it's descriptive, it tends to be narrative, it's denotative. It's the opposite of possibility. It's probability. It's likelihood. It's reality, man. And she, Dickinson is saying, I dwell in possibility. And what was that, that where, where she dwelt? I'm so glad I brought up this poem. Her house. Her house. And this is a house, too. This is why this is a Dickinsonian poem in Mod Po, because she's saying, I have a house, but it's a house of possibility. And frankly, the bank can take the prose part of it. Leave me the poetry. Leave me the land. Which is the peace. Which is? The peace. The is peace. the poetry and the land. Yeah, we did all this work already on it. But still, I want to hear from Suzanne on this any way you like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think Do you have anything to add? Pretty pretty much, you, no, I think yeah. everybody's pretty much said what I was thinking. How about, oh, Suzanne, how about May? That diction, may, prose, and property, may. It's a funny use of may since she's been so rude about her verbs so may far. May is, is, is prayerful. It's a prayer. Yeah. Or a curse. Yeah. Or a curse. <laughs> Isn't this a curse? Isn't this a curse? <laughs> Dear bankers, right? Thanks a lot for taking my house, my mother's house, in the middle of nowhere. What are you going to do with this house? But thanks. May prose and property die. <laughs> it's really she's mad yeah. Dan do you have a thought on this nice thank you Dan um, prose and property are gone what's left it's a ratio prose is to property as what is to what what's left what's the opposite Prose is gone, what's left? Poetry. Poetry. Property's gone, peace. what's left? Peace. 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 This is a peace poem that starts to be about a bank takeover. I want to get final words. I love this poem, and our conversation about it, I think, has been fantastic. Let's just end by getting any final words. Anybody want to say anything? And you can say simply that you really like the poem and what you like about it. So who wants to start? 
I don't know why I have this. It's not really saying why I love it, but it's just the thought that I'm left with is thinking if there was a line after the end that said scratch out colon peace. And I don't know why, but I feel like there's a level of anger here that is dissipated by the end. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like it's, I feel like it's not, like her anger isn't fully justified by the end. I don't know why. I don't love the ending you're suggesting, but I like, I very much appreciate the sentiment. I mean, as an editorial matter, yeah. I kind of like the way the poem ends. That's great, thank you. Anybody else have a Al Dan has something word? to say. Yes, can we get the, that free mic in his direction? Where is it? Oh, fantastic. Oh, am great. I not loud enough? That's great. No, you're great. <laughs> um, he said that he loved the bastardization of legalese and um, the commentary on the impersonal government. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And indeed, um, if, if this poem is first and foremost about peace in relation to Native American concepts of land, it is secondly about language. She's trying to rescue the language from the human organizations that use language to obscure the fact that they're hurting people. She's an anarchist. She is being very anarchistic here, yeah. Any other final words? I really would love to hear. Erica, what do you think? You like this poem, right? I love this poem. Yeah, say why. Did it, isn't it possible that you were in on a poem talk conversation about this? No. No, okay. not this poem. Okay. Um, I just, I always admire the, the way that Niedeker uses form. Mm -hmm. Like, this is such a tight mm -hmm. little vessel that accomplishes a huge amount. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Trace, do you have a final thought on this? Um. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, I think what you say about property is very interesting, and um, there's something really evocative for me here about um, the nature of property in relation to language, um, whether one can have ownership of language or not, mm. and yeah, whether ownership of what it means to cross out a phrase. Yeah. Yeah, that's really great. And a, uh, and a dwelling associated with that phrase. Yeah. You've restated that beautifully, thank you. Um, Chris Lee, you're gonna have the final, final word since you're such a genius. You're the happy genius of the foundation. <laughs> well, I'm uh, somewhat thinking that she's foreclosing on herself as a writer because she is asking to become naked. In other words, all, all the walls are being taken away, the land's being taken away. So it does harken back a little bit to William Stan's Bruce. But at the same time, I think she's saying that it's impossible to, as one of our discussion forms says, get to the truth as a poet. So in the end, she floats off into the distance, and I don't know where she is. Yeah, I guess ultimately we have to know whether the title of the poem refers to the situation of the house or includes the problem of language. And I tend not to think that as depressed as she is in this situation and respecting Allison's instinct to try to finish it with slightly more hopefully or more coherently, less open-endedly, I don't think she's foreclosing on language. I think actually she feels, as has been suggested, that she's, as Dan suggested, she's found a way to start over. and and. Modernism, and she's, you know, slightly second generation modernist. Um, modernism in, in its most idealistic was about restarting language. Williams talked revolu in a revolutionary way about, you know, taking down language like clearing the Carpathian Mountains, just start blowing the whole thing up and starting over, that kind of revolutionary impulse. And certainly Gertrude Stein and Tender Buttons felt that what she was doing was redoing connotation. And I think Gloria Niedeker had that, though she would never have d been happy about it, uh, n nor would she celebrate it, had that instinct to start over. And I think this poem is sort of about back, getting back to basics, stripping all the walls and getting back. So thank you all. You were great doing this. I really appreciate it. Give yourselves a big hand.